that's great. Good. Nice to have everyone here. Um, I'm going to, my intention is to talk for 45 to 50 minutes. I've started my, my timer. And then maybe 15 minutes of Q&A. And then, uh, or none, if nobody has any questions. And then um, some book signing if you're interested. So um, we'll sort of go right to it here. And we'll start right here. Oh, no, we won't. We'll start right there. Um, like many great, like many things great and huge in New York, it all begins with an immigrant family from Sweden. That was his, that was his father in the first slide, um, who apparently was the huge hair model for. <laughs> that works, right? <laughs> In any case, the Calatrava uh, World, Tri World, uh, World Trade Center transportation hub is below the grid. We're not really going to talk about it anymore. Now we're getting right into the, the real history. Um, this is where New York City's grid uh, of 1811 really came from. Uh, it's a 1790s plan requested of surveyor Casimir Gork, G-O-E-R-C-K, noble maybe because he was married to a um, predecessor of the presidential Roosevelt's. Um, Gork was hired by the city to parcel out its 1,300 acre uh, common lands. It's a, uh, a bunch of land in the middle of the island that the city had owned for uh, many years and hadn't done very much with because the city was, was growing up from the southern tip of, of the island. And what Gert did was, on his own initiative, survey the 1,300 acre common lands into five acre plots that were, uh, especially the central stack of them, which you can see there, were 920 feet wide and 260 feet tall, with the top 60 feet of those 260 intended for streets. Now, in the common lands of natural state, well, when that was just still natural Manhattan there, um, it was the least desirable land on Manhattan. It was the hilliest, the boggiest, uh, the most remote from the island shores, and miles north of the settled city, which is over two miles further to the south. Um, it was granted by Dutch authority, the common lands were granted by Dutch authority to the local Dutch government. Back when New York was in Amsterdam, it passed down through English to America, and passed down through English to American city government. Um, here's where that bit looks, here's how that bit places in the island of Manhattan. Right. It's almost like a miniature of Manhattan in a strange way. But that's the common land superimposed over the, the map of the grid, which we'll talk about in, in a moment. Um, it's like an angular egg. Uh, it, it's the angular egg that spawned the chicken wire Manhattan grid that, is, uh, that was rolled out in 1811, and most of, uh, most of us have been living on ever since. Um, we'll dig in a little closer. Uh, these are the two uh, artistic renderings of the, uh, of the common land map. And what you begin to see is that, um, well, I should note that the city wanted these, the common land divided up into five acre lots to sell and make money because the city was cash poor in the 1790s. But unfortunately, very little of these lots were actually sold. And so much of the common land's plan never really came into existence. Um, however, and make, let me just note here, here is, these are the lot numbers, the common land lots. And there's this intersection here, the middle road, and these four lots here, which also is back here. And that is, in fact, the intersection of uh, 72nd Street <coughs> and 5th Avenue. And we'll talk about why there's no um, Central Park there, because there is no. Um, in any case, a uh, few of Gert's Plan, a little of Gert's plan actually materialized, but um, where were his partially realized east, middle, and west roads? East, middle, west. 
Um, they are exactly where, in 1811, the grid plan put 4th Avenue, 5th Avenue, and 6th Avenue. And where were those um, unrealized, six, and what of those unrealized 60-foot cross streets, which you can sort of see outlined here? Right. See the dotted the solid line and the dotted line? Um, those are precisely where all our 60-foot wide cross streets are now. Now, we'll explain how that came to be in a moment. It didn't have to be this way. It could have been something like this. This is the, um, a synthetic plan that was devised in 1803 by a French a uh, surveyor engineer named Joseph Francois Magin. He was an early partner in this map with Casimir Gork, who developed the common land map uh, about a, a decade earlier. Um, this might have been the plan for the future development of New York if it had not been trashed by Aaron Burr. There is no time to talk about that <laughs> now. I could answer a question about it. You could also read the book. Um, in any case, uh, Burr, by the way, uh, I'll tell you briefly. Uh, Burr was uh, very angry that Magin had a few months earlier, before, just before he put out this, this offer, this plan to the city in 1803, that Magin had defeated Burr's protege for the city hall design competition. In fact, Joseph Francois Magin is the the major designer, is the designer of our current city hall. So he was no slouch. Um, um, what Magin did with his plan, and you know, we'll give you just some, some locations here. This is uh, their city hall right there. And what he's done is he has set, set none of this was built, he planned all this. He had a segment of grid here, and then a segment of grid off at a different angle, and a segment of grid here, and a different segment of grid here, really relying on and based on natural contours of the land. So if this plan had gone and happened as the city wanted it to, um, you might have had all of Manhattan continuing in this manner as it stepped up, up the island. You might have had a city that looks more, say, like the, uh, the Paris of Magellan's birth. In any case, um, Magellan called this uh, plan uh, not the plan of the city as it is, but uh, the city as it shall be, which I think is probably the, the first words ever written, if not thought, about planning in New York. Because the southern tip of Manhattan was notoriously unplanned. Streets were just made wherever landowners uh, owned the land and they put streets wherever they wanted. And the city uh, street commissioner, relative, relatively powerless office at that time, just said, oh, you want to put a street there? Well, good, done. But this is the beginning of the change. Um, so uh, Burr sabotages this plan. The city, which liked this plan, but was sort of coerced into rejecting it, says, oh, okay, uh, that was a good plan, maybe we need, actually need one. And in 1807, they go to the state and empower a commission to come up with one. Well, I'll talk about that in a moment, but I'll give you just some, some, uh, some logistics. This is the northern end of the Magellan plan, right, that we saw back there. This is the southern limit of the 1811 grid plan. Okay. Here we are right here. Uh, where are we? Right there. Right? This is the village. So the, the Greenwich Village, the village of Greenwich then, was left out of the um, purview of the commissioners appointed in 1807. They could not plan in here. They had to plan north of this line number three. Okay? Um, when they did that, they also happened to, this line number two is the Magellan Plan. They actually retained this part of the Magellan Plan, which is very interesting. I probably shouldn't really be talking about it, but I will for a moment. Uh, Magellan, in the part of the city that up there sort of uh, imagined what should happen, down here we took the existing city and idealized it, creating, among other things, West Street and South Street. Those streets came into being, essentially because of the supposedly rejected Magellan plan, largely because the commissioners, uh, the 1807 commissioners who came up with the grid said, okay, well, we'll just, we're not dealing with their, this area, so we'll just let the Magellan plan stand there. Yeah, that's a little too detailed for us. In any case, 
let's go to the head. Um, the 1807 law sought by the city and passed in all uh, gives a three man commission absolute power and four years to decide whatever they want, with one requirement only a minimum street width of 50 feet, not 60, 50, from the southern boundary that I showed you on the east uh, along North Street, then called North Street, now, now Houston Street, on the east to the northern limits of the Long Savage Road to Greenwich on the west. There was no requirement in the law for them to report their progress or even explain their eventual plan. They were just supposed to announce it in 1811. Now, who were the commissioners? Uh, the lead commissioner was aging founding father, Gouverneur Morris. You may have heard of him. Uh, one of the sort of like, I, I like to say, if, if the founding fathers were a basketball team, he's the sixth man. <laughs> right, he's the guy who comes off the bench to do stuff. He, he, wrote, he hand wrote the final draft of the U.S. Constitution. We the people of these United States, that's Morris. Uh, he was also a, um, a, an inveterate, um, uh, uh, well, he put, he put Clinton to shame. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and he, 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 obtained, he obtained that peg leg in uh, an escape from a, uh, a, uh, a bedroom. <laughs> and um, he made ample use of that peg leg in a lifetime of activities such as that. <laughs> well documented. Not that you know. um, um, but he was also a man of no uncertainty. What he wanted is what he thought should happen. Here are the guys he worked with. Uh, on the left is um, the second most important commissioner, Albany-based uh, New York State Surveyor General uh, Simon DeWitt. Very important guy, but we're not going to go into him too much. In the middle it is um, uh, New Jersey, the largest New Jersey landowner, John Rutherford. Rutherford namesake of Rutherford, New Jersey, who happened also to be a uh, nephew of Gouverneur Morris's. He was like Morris's yes man on the commission. <laughs> and on the right is their chief surveyor, uh, who was, um, didn't come in until one year into the project. The commissioners originally hired a local guy who was no good. Then Simon DeWitt brought his protege down from uh, Albany. Uh, John Randall, a headstrong guy, a real case in himself. A lot about him in the book, I can't talk about it too much here. Uh, but he, when he was given the job of getting the surveys for whatever the commissioners were doing, decided to do, he was 20 years old. And he'd never been to Manhattan before. Probably not the best setup. Um, so, did they work hard on their task? Uh, Randall certainly did, but only so much as the commissioners did. Uh, Rutherford was mostly busy in New Jersey with his vast estate lands. Simon DeWitt uh, rarely visited New York City. He was mostly busy with state surveys up in Albany. He actually didn't really like coming to New York. Um, Governor Morris himself, who lived in Morrisania, his estate in what's now the South Bronx, the Morrisania section of the Bronx, that was his family's estate. Uh, he was either home most of the time with gout, urinary issues, and, and other physical maladies, or he was up north attending to his vast land holdings in northern and western uh, part of the state. In early 1810, three years into their four-year uh, term, um, Morris and Simon DeWitt were suddenly named to the first Erie Canal Commission. The commission that they were working on to make streets for New York, suddenly, that they weren't very much involved with, suddenly they're on the Erie Canal Commission and they are very involved with that, which gives you a sense of the relative importance of the street plan to the people who were actually doing the planning. Um, as best I can tell, uh, the commissioners uh, decided on the, the great grid, or the, the greatest grid to some, in early December 1810. In other words, three months before their timeline ran right out. Um, their, their time was running out, they had no better idea, and they simply appropriated and expanded the unbuilt, mostly unbuilt, common lands without a word of credit, making it seem as if the plan was their home, which it clearly was not. Uh, in early March 1811, Governor Morris submits a 150-page uh, uh, detailed report with engineering uh, details and all sorts of uh, sophisticated arguments for the Erie Canal. Three weeks later, 
he submits an 11 page handwritten report, which is mostly uh, uh, like boilerplate stuff with a few paragraphs about um, the map that they announced in 1811. There are about three or four paragraphs in there, and that is the entire explanation for our grid. So, um, let's go in a little tight. Well, the, 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 there's, the, there's the thing itself. It's hard to see, and, and you know, it's a big map. It's hard to see here, but you'll know no Central Park, and you probably can't really see it, but no Broadway. We'll talk about that in a moment. Dig in a little tighter, and you can probably get a sense of where we are. That is um, that is the intersection of 23rd and uh, Broadway and Fifth Avenue. And you can see Broadway does not continue past it. It goes to there and dead ends. You know, a thing called the parade, which got, got legislated away pretty quickly. Um, now, so they could have come up with it whatever plan they wanted. Why right angles? In their explanatory remarks, they they um, wrote probably moving or more so. They didn't take they didn't take any nobody claimed authorship of the of these of these so-called explanatory remarks. And in them, the commissioners are referred to in the third person. It's just very strange. Um, in any case, why right angles only? Quote: One of the first objects which claimed their attention was the form and manner in which the business should be conducted. That is, to say, that is to say, whether they should confine themselves to rectilinear and rectangular streets, or whether they should adopt some of those supposed improvements by circles, ovals, and stars, which certainly embellish a plan, whatever may be their effect as to convenience and utility. Continuing. In considering that subject, they could not but bear in mind that a city, here it is, is to be composed principally of the habitations of men and that straight-sided and right-angled houses are the most cheap to build and the most convenient to live in. The effect of these plain and simple reflections was decisive. Boom, oh, end of story. Why, uh, and again, they did not, they could come up with their, whatever plan they wanted. That's why they chose right angles. Um, why so few and small open spaces, like this parade here, which in a few years was legislated out of existence anyway. Quoting again from the remarks, it may be a matter of surprise, certainly is, that so few vacant spaces have been left and those so small for the benefit of fresh air and consequent preservation of health. Certainly, if the city of New York was destined to stand on the side of a small stream, such as the Sand or the Thames, a great number of ample places might be needed. But those large arms of the sea, which embraced Manhattan Island, rendered its situation in regard to health and pleasure, as well as to the inconvenience, to the convenience of commerce, peculiarly felicitous. Now, apparently not felicitous enough to require necessary relief of Central Park 40 years later and, and Broadway eventually. Uh, go up to the upper part of the plan. Uh, it ends at what they called 150th history. That's as far as they went. Why? This is the third and, and last explanatory remark in their explanatory remarks. Um, to some, it may be a matter of surprise. I think they expected everyone to be surprised. That the whole island has not been laid out as a city. To others, it may be a subject of merriment. The commissioners have provided the space for a greater population that is collected at any spot on this side of China. They have in this respect been governed by the shape of the ground. It is improbable that for centuries to come, the grounds north will be covered with houses. Centuries to come. <laughs> to have come short of the extent laid out might have defeated just expectations. To have gone further might have furnished materials to the pernicious spirit of speculation. That's clearly good in Mark's writing. That's how we wrote. Now, of course, the lands below 155th Street uh, became an extraordinary field of speculation. Um, the best example is John Jacob Astor. Uh, he made a fortune in the fur trade before 1830 when he chucked the fur trade and went into Manhattan real estate in Tyra. And it was his speculative investments in Manhattan real estate far uptown that made him the richest man in America. Um, the plan itself was very vague. It was, it was uh, streets and avenues placed on uh, a map with really no topographic detail, how was rivers, streams, hills, valleys uh, being involved with this, um, just wasn't in there. Um, so this is an example 
of how difficult um, it was as a plan to implement. Now, when the missions were done in 1811, the city retained John Randall to make very detailed maps that were essentially missing from the 1811 plan. It's been a decade doing that. And here's one of his maps. This is the southern extent of the grid in the middle. Uh, this is like Washington Square is down here. Okay? I don't know if you can see it. That's 14th Street, and that is Fifth Avenue. Okay? So you can faintly see these rectilinear lines, but what are all these other ones? Those are property lines. <laughs> So this was not a grid laid on a, a, uh, on a, a clean canvas. This is a set of X's and Y axes laid on a very busy map of, of, uh, of owned property. Um, before he died, uh, John Randall, uh, he, he had a pretty pathetic career after this. Uh, he was uh, long impoverished, long impoverished, professionally uh, uh, broken very early on. But in 1964, before he died, he called the grid, quote, the pride and boast of this city. But he also admitted, quote, the time within which the commissioners were limited by the statute to make their plan of the streets and avenues of Manhattan was barely sufficient to enable them to comply with the letter and not fully with the spirit. The statute. So on the ground, the situation uh, was not so simple as um, as it appeared to be. And I think we'll just go a little tighter. Uh, I don't really need to do that. Just a little tighter, the same thing. But you see the rectilinear streets that are going to be <coughs> essentially, well, there's, there's some streams right there, which are essentially going to be uh, screwing with property rights uh, right at the bottom there. Uh, at the, the bottom center part of the grid and working its way all the way up the island for, for, um, for decades. Now, of course, those property owners were, many of them, rather pissed off. That's it. Um, does anybody recognize? Yep. No? Okay. Yo, let me, oh, it's Clement Park Moore. It was the night before Christmas, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, he wrote an anonymous pamphlet in 1818. There was surprisingly little reaction to the when it was first announced. The first time it was first announced. People didn't realize that it was actually going to happen. It might have just been a, a commission that, that denounced findings and, and nothing happened. This one did. In 1818, uh, Moore writes an anonymous pamphlet. His name is very quickly discovered. In which he says, the commissioners were, quote, men who had cut down the seven hills of Rome. <laughs> we lived under a tyranny with respect to the rights of property which no monarch in Europe would dare to exercise. Our public authorities seem unwilling to depart from their leveling propensities, but proceed to cut up and tear down the face of the earth without the least remorse, and apparently with no higher notions of beauty and elegance than straight lines and flat surfaces placed at right angles with the horizon, just sufficient to suffer the mud and water to creep quietly down their declivities. He's also here. Um, Moore, though, was pretty smart, and he relented pretty quickly. And very shortly after that pamphlet was written, he decided to subdivide his estate into the neighborhood, subdivide his estate at great profit, according to the streets that were going to be laid through it, uh, subdivide his estate um, into the neighborhood that retains the, his estate's original name, Chelsea. Um, many others. Uh, fought for decades to little avail. Uh, landowners went to court and they lost because the 1811, the 1807 law was ruled sacrosanct. It could not be violated, except in very small circumstances. But generally, if you were just a landowner and you didn't want to speak for anything your land, you lost. Except for landowners along Bloomingdale Road, or Bloomingdale Road, which was a continuation of the city's Broadway, Broadway in the city that moved up the west side of Bloomingdale Road. Um, over several decades, the owners of land along Bloomingdale Road, which was an important north-south original thoroughfare, succeeded in having bits of Bloomingdale put back into the plan as Broadway. And by about 1850 or so, all the Bloomingdale was returned into what became Broadway. And that's how we have Broadway today not what the commissioners wanted, but they were going with it. 
Um, and with Broadway, of course, we get those, just those diagonal roads that the commissioners despise, that irregularity that they despise. Um, but he gives us our celebrated regular spaces. Uh, Madison Square and the Flatiron Building, uh, Herald Square, Times Square, Columbus Circle, Lincoln Center and Square, and those snappy bow ties at 72nd Street. Um, but let's move ahead. Oh, one more quick one now. Um, 1852. Uh, make you hard to see, hope you can. The first development, Buck Island development, is mostly on the west side. All these dark squares and, and rectangles are development on the west side. Not much on the east side. Um, and again, you can see Broadway beginning to get hard to see here. But you can, and remember that little that square that I showed you before, that's pretty much gone. And you can begin to see Broadway reasserting itself here, right? Beginning to establish itself in the map that was not originally planned. Let's jump ahead. That's 1852. Let's jump ahead to 1879. I had to turn it this way, it's hard to be. But, um, in 25 years, development has stopped on the west side and expanded dramatically on the east side and we have this funny thing in the middle which wasn't intended and I'll talk about that in, um, in a moment. Um, so let's, let's go back and see what, what was actually going on on the ground. As you can see this is 1847. That is, anybody know what that is? Exactly, the Code Reservoir at the intersection of 5th Avenue and 42nd Street. That's what it looked like in 1847, for that 42nd Street. See the parapet up there? Did anybody read the alienist? Yeah. Yeah. That's what the final scene happened. Mm -hmm. right. um, somebody who liked to walk around that parapet was Paul Whitman. Uh, he wrote in late 1849, quote, the elevated and stony grounds about here will cost their owners dearly, dearly to get them graded and paid. It is a pity that greater favor is not given to the natural hills and slopes of the ground on Manhattan Island. Our perpetual dead flat and streets cutting each other at right angles are certainly the last things in the world consistent with beauty of situation. So you remember that, 1847, let's jump ahead 50 years, boom. And the city happens pretty quickly, right? There's a reservoir at 5th Avenue 42nd in its dwindling days. A couple of years later, the New York Public Library. So that's quite a transition in about 50 years. Um, and what's interesting to me about the, the, the public library location is that um, um, it's a relatively beautiful location. And there aren't very many in Manhattan like that. And the only reason it's there is because there was a reservoir there before the grid street started appearing. Uh, without a reservoir there originally, that land would have just been taken over by 39th, uh, 41st Street coming through there, and um, you wouldn't just been another piece of city. You wouldn't have had this sort of really kind of spectacular building. Um, now, Whitman, Whitman wasn't the only person lamenting the, uh, the flattening of his uh, of, of once beautiful island. We also have his Whitman's contemporary, Edgar Allan Poe. Um, he had a rented room in this farmhouse along Bloomingdale Road uh, in 1844 when he, where, uh, he wrote here The Raven. And he also wrote this. I've been roaming far and wide over this island of Manhattan. The spirit of improvement has withered magnificent places with its acrid breath. Streets are already mapped through them. They are no longer suburban residences but town lots. In some 30 years, the whole island will be densely desecrated by buildings of brick with portentous facades of brown stone. And sure enough, 30 years later, he was right. Oh, I'm sorry, I was supposed to be showing you. There he is. And sure enough, 30 years later, he was quite right because his old, the old farmhouse that he wrote in was that. And that's 1879, that's Broadway, and 84th Street here in the, the, the final days of the Brennan Schoolhouse. You can see the hill that it was on, it's been blasted away, and 
a rickety staircase leading up to it, and a couple of years, the Brennan farmhouse will be gone. Um, let's talk about Central Park. That's from out Queens, if anybody's been there. The, uh, uh, where is it? Um, I'm blanking. Uh, exactly, thank you. Um, in the early 1850s, some forward-thinking civic leaders in New York realized that if the entire city was covered with grid, as the commission was intended, those large arms of the sea, which were going to make everybody healthy, were not quite substantial enough or large enough to actually do that. And so they carved out Central Park, most of it from land that was originally common lands. So it was easier to acquire the land because the city still owned a fair, fair amount of it. Um, what I love, what is incredible to me about um, Central Park is that um, it has no right angles and it has plenty of nature. It is like the, the antithesis of the grid. And the guys who designed it, of course, um, Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvin Vox, uh, Vox didn't care so much, but Olmsted despised the grid. And he designed a park that was the antithesis of the grid. And he wrote, in 1858. Um, the time will come when New York will be all built up. All the grading and filling will be done, the picturesquely varied rock formations converted to rows of monotonous straight streets and piles of erect angular buildings. There will be no suggestion left of its present varied surface, with a single exception of the few acres contained in the park. It's being modest, there are 873 acres among the 14,000 and a half or so acres. All right, let's just quickly look at some other images. Uh, that explains itself. That's 6th Avenue. Uh, well, it doesn't, if I look at here. In 1868, uh, looks pretty different. Looks look pretty different 100 years later uh, with uh, um, you know, corporate headquarters. But you had the hills cut away, the beginnings of, of uh, uh, streetcars. Uh, living up here are squatters. Uh, who would live there temporarily at, um, um, with the, the uh, acceptance of the landowner until the rest of the hill was cut down and a proper building could be built. But that's 6th Avenue and you know, what is now corporate 6th Avenue. Um, this is my, one of my favorites. This is um, 1882. This is West 70th Street between 8th and 9th Avenues. As you can see, it's, it's very recently been cut through, right? It's still dirt. There are the hills that have been cut down. There are squatter shacks. No services, no city services of any kind. Um, now we go, just keep that in your head, that's 1882. And here we go to 16 years later. Exact, that's the same law. And it looks as though it's been there forever. From, from newborn to full grown, 16 years. All of my kids are getting <laughs> um, And it looks like a place that is, has been there forever. And uh, you get a sense that the people who live there probably don't even know the history of the place. Um, they moved in, you know, in the, uh, in the 1890s and had no idea that it wasn't uh, a city block for forever. Uh, let's move on. Go up town a little bit. This is um, uh, 1880. This is West 86th Street looking west from 8th Avenue. There's a lot going on here. Okay? This is this valley here is going to be 86th Street. These are um, probably German uh, squatter farmers who lived there for a little while until the street was laid, until this land was filled in. This is a fascinating building. Why? It's different from this because this is a lot line building. This building is the first building built along what will be 86th Street. Right? It has windows here, which you can barely see. It has no windows on the east face. Why? Because another building will be built uh, right up next to it, you know, really soon. And that's a 9th Avenue L in the back. Uh, this, is a, um, in, this is also in 1880, an unnamed street, but the contrast is, is astounding. Look at the size of this outcrop here. Here's a very handsome, looks like a handsome building with mansard roof. Here is a rock outcrop that is, appears to be taller than it, with its temporary squatter shack and the uh, squatter shacks and the uh, uh, rickety uh, staircase going up. In a few years, this will be another one of those. This is another wonderful. This is um, 
uh, 3rd Avenue at 46th Street in 1868. Um, this is an incredible oil by a painter named Mario Alessandro. He called it, Give Us This Day Our Daily Bread. And what you have is sort of a Rogelian scene of a chaotic scene of city building here, of landscape already denuded of its natural beauty. Uh, maybe, you know, sometimes it's hard to see it in these lights, but if you can find the same image, you can find it online. I mean, it's, it, they're digging out a, 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 a excavating pit for, for a big building. There's all kinds of mud and grime and, and just um, intense uh, uh, city building activity going on. There's another, there's another uh, excavation going on there. This is 3rd Avenue, 46th Street in, um, in uh, 1868. Jump ahead, the same neighborhood, 100 years. And uh, that neighborhood is right about there. And what you have here is, um, this is an amazing uh, 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 axonometric map that was done for the 1964 World's Fair. Um, but you get a sense, um, the designer of the map said it was uh, intended to, quote, to uh, convey, quote, the soaring beauty of the city. It's a very different sort of beauty from, from earlier uh, concepts of beauty. But it's also a graphic illustration of the only place the grid had to go after filling the land, and that was up into the sky. And I hope you can get a sense of these buildings rising, you know, out of the earth, to previously under heights, but certainly nothing like we've got to now. Mm -hmm. Exactly, thank you. <laughs> uh, 432 Park. Um, um, the urbanizing uh, uh, skyline in New York, which is first dominated, as many cities were, by church spires, then by skyscrapers of commerce, the uh, Woolworth Building, Singer, Chrysler, uh, Empire State Building, later the World Trade Center. Uh, now, the skyline is increasingly filled with uh, condo stacks or absent elites. Uh, Adam Gopnik in The New Yorker uh, called this building, anybody remember? Uh, he called this the oligarch's erection. <laughs> uh, Martin Filler in uh, The New Yorker Review of Books commenting on this building and other light going up now, called them etiolated oddities. It's a nice one. And I, less, felic less felicitously perhaps, uh, but because these buildings are all, are all creatures of their mundane right-angled brown lots, I call them, quote, the weird progeny of incestuous rectilinear generations. <laughs> that work? Yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, 432 Park architect uh, Raphael Vinoli loves the grid, uh, which anchors his fire. He says, quote, the grid is, quote, the best manifestation of American pragmatism in the creation of urban form. Um, so we have grid lovers, we have grid haters, and we have grid lovers, in particular, Corbusier, um, who wrote in 1947, the streets are at right angles to each other, and the mind is liberated. I insist on right angle intersections. Lovers, haters, and others. <laughs> John Sartre, in 1946, on his first visit uh, to New York ever, he was at ease walking quickly, but, quote, if I stop, I get flustered and wonder, why am I on this street? rather than one of hundreds like it. And let's just put it together, because I think that works right now. <laughs> Which may tell you nothing more than, you know, Frenchmen in the 1940s wore brown quarter shell glasses. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, for for, um, for Sartre, Sartre um, had a particularly existential dilemma at the corner of Lexington and 52nd, a seemingly easy thing to deal with. He got there and he said, quote, this spatial precision is not accompanied by any emotional exactitude. <laughs> um, so, 
This is um, the intersection of 42nd Street and 2nd Avenue in 1861. That 2nd Avenue disappearing into the disappearing to the north. Um, um, you have here New York Old and New, which I think is very graphically represented. You have the wood country house, isolated on the right, doomed on the remains of its blasted hill, facing, and that's, that's there. This, this hill here belonged to that house. The hill is gone, the staircase, that house is leaving, is going away soon, the porch is falling off, and falling off already. And that house is looking at the future, something we saw like back in 86 years a lot line building, multi-family dwelling, no windows on here the south side, there be many more like it. And yet, here are the New Yorkers. They seem to be enjoying it. They seem to be enjoying their, uh, their out promenade, promenade in their uh, new linear city. when the, uh, the guy who drew the original drawing was drawing it. Um, because what it does is it shows that the past, um, shows the past with the colors uh, that it certainly had. Um, and it illustrates that the past and the present are just points along the continuous line to whatever the future holds. And I think I'm done.